Today we're going to continue our discussion of the music of the Baroque era. We're going to focus on one of the essential compositional procedures of this time, known as the fugue. The fugue cannot be thought of as a genre or as a style of composition. It doesn't really have any defining features other than a fugal subject which is repeated throughout the fugue and, submit, and subjected to various manipulations. Over time, most particularly during the 1800s, there was a misnomer that the fugue could be defined very strictly as a form with notable features. This was the, the misnomer of the textbook fugue, which emerged towards the end of the 1800s and was studied as, as law, but in fact it's, 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 it is as one would say, a misnomer. The fugue, simply put, is a compositional procedure. It has certain features. Most notably, there is the procedure of imitation. At the beginning of a fugue, a subject is stated. When this fugal subject is repeated, it is imitated by the other voices in the fugue. The fugue tends to have several voices. Most often three or four voices, although there are once again no exact rules regarding the number of voices. But there is a fugal subject. This is the essence of the fugue. One could almost say the point of the fugue is to show how the composer is adept at manipulating a fugal subject. He subjects it to various manipulations throughout the fugue. He takes it on a journey as it were. So, at the beginning of the fugue, there is a fugal subject. This is then imitated, usually at the interval of the fifth, by the other voices in what is known as the opening exposition. Each voice takes a turn to state the fugal subject. After they have finished stating, after each voice has stated the subject, this is the end of the opening exposition, and then there is what is known as an episode. Fugue should be distinguished from canon along the following lines. In a canon, there is a theme which is imitated very strictly by another voice or several voices at a certain temporal imitative distance. And this is followed throughout until the end, until the canon, which essentially means the rule, until, until this rule has been played out. The fugue is a bit different. A fugue must have episodes. This is one of the key differences between the fugue and the canon. So as we mentioned, the, the opening fugal exposition comes to an end and then we have the first episode. An episode is there to provide freshness and contrast. It might often take fragments of the fugal subject or introduce other unrelated material which follows a series of patterns and sequences. But now, after the episode is finished, this is followed by another exposition, again, not a strict exposition, but uh, a situation in which the fugal subject is stated, perhaps once, perhaps twice, there once again no exact rules regarding the other expositions. The opening exposition must have all of the voices state the fugal subject. This is absolutely critical. They must all imitate the fugal subject, each of the voices in turn, usually at the interval of a fifth. Also importantly, when the fugal subject is first introduced and with each subsequent imitation, it must be introduced unaccompanied. Or at least the first statement of the fugal subject must be unaccompanied to allow the listener to become acquainted with the fugal subject. Because as we mentioned, the whole point of the fugue is to savor the composer's ability to manipulate the subject and to take it along a journey uh, to see what he can do with the fugal subject. So the first fugal subject might occur in any one of the voices, the soprano, the alto, the tenor, the bass. But sometimes, and not in all fugues, when the, the second statement of the subject occurs, this is known as the answer form. It, it might be what is known as a real answer, in which case it is an exact replication of the initial subject, or it might be known as a tonal form. Some sort of change has been made to the subject to prevent it from spiraling out of control into a different key. In other words, it has been tonally adjusted to ensure that one stays within the key. 
There might be a few notes which have been changed. This is the, the answer form of the subject. So one has the subject and then the answer form of the subject, then the subject again and a third voice and then another voice. Perhaps we might state the answer form. Again, there are no exact, there isn't an exact number of voices in a fugue, but the opening exposition is pretty much the only defined feature of the fugue. What happens thereafter is free, the composer will take the subject on a journey, he will have subjected to a whole series of manipulations. So in a sense one can understand fugue as being a compositional procedure. It is an imitative compositional procedure. It is polyphonic in texture because the voices are all independent. We don't necessarily have a hom homophonic texture. There might be homophonic passages in some of the expositions, but as a defining feature, the fugue is a polyphonic compositional procedure which gives weight to, the, to each of the indi individual voices. Uh, that is the whole point. One, one, one wants to hear the, the fugal subject stated clearly in different voices, in different guises. It might be subjected to various contrapuntal manipulations, which we're going to discuss. One of these contrapuntal manipulations is a procedure known as stretto. Again, stretto is a subset of canon, but it's not exactly the same thing. But it is similar. In a stretto, a fugal subject is stated, but before it is completed, another statement overlaps with the initial statement of the stretto. So it is akin to canon. Another compositional procedure which the composer might use in a fugue is something known as pedal point. This is something borrowed essentially from the pipe organ. One thinks of the pipe organ, the organist might put down his foot on one particular note, usually the tonic or the dominant tone, and then he'll have a series of unfolding harmonies which he plays, or that they, they emerge perhaps from a polyphonic texture, but whatever he does on the keyboards above will sort of clash in a way with the pedal point. It will present a series of contrasting harmonies uh, and this sits on top of the pedal point. It creates a sense of tension. The listener is anticipating the resolution of this dominant pedal point onto the tonic, or the composer might prolong the tonic with the pedal point, with various unfolding harmonies above on the pedals. And of course, this is used on other keyboards, not only the pipe organ and um, the piano, or I suppose Bach essentially wrote fugues for the harpsichord or the clavichord, as we mentioned in our first lecture. Baroque composers were not exactly particular about which keyboard instrument was used. They might have written a work for the organ and been content for it to be played on the clavichord or the harpsichord. It was understood that the instrumentation was interchangeable. Now there are various key contrapuntal manipulations which were often used. One of these is melodic inversion. This is a key feature in fugues. One sees that in some of the passages later on, the opening fugal subject might be, but might be melodically inverted. In other words, if initially the subject followed a certain contour, this will be replicated but in melodic imitation. So, melodic inversion rather. If the notes went up in the initial fugal subject, they will go down in the melodically inverted form, and vice versa. It is like a mirror image. There is also a retrograde form in this manipulation. If the initial fugal subject followed a certain contour, one now follows it backwards, as it were. One states the subject more or less backwards, not strictly speaking, but this is retrograde form. There is also augmentation, in which if the notes were a certain value in the initial subject, now they are double the value or quadruple the value. They are augmented. And by the converse, there is diminution. So in the dim in diminished form, the initial notes of the fugal subject are half the value or a quarter the value. All of these devices lend color to the fugue, they make it interesting, because that is in essence the whole point of the fugue. It is the platform for the composer to demonstrate his ability to take this fugal subject on a journey, to manipulate it, to subject it to a whole series of manipulations perhaps traversing various, various key areas such as the relative major or the relative minor and he might go into the subdominant or dominant key area 
But he walks the subject along, manipulating it in all these different ways. Stretto is a key feature, particularly in Bach's fugues. Now, fugue in essence, like Baroque works in general, has one particular mood, and this mood unfolds. The, the fugue is characterized by a sense of generation, of flow. It is continuous in nature. The fugue might form part of what is known as a prelude in a fugue. Bach in particular wrote, as we know, the well-tempered clavier, which consisted of 24 preludes and fugues in each of the, the 12 different key areas. Uh, as we have to remember, he wrote this work to actually demonstrate the ability of the newly well-tempered clavier to play in all of the different keys in tune. This was a novel feature. Previously, only some of the keys could be in tune. And then they developed what was the, what known as the 12-tone system. It was a compromise. Now each of the, the, the semitones, or each of the 12 chromatic notes from the beginning of the octave to the end of the octave, uh, was tuned in a sort of compromised fashion to allow all of the, the notes to be more or less in tune. So Bach took advantage of this well-tempered clavier, and he composed a, a compendium, a collection of 24 preludes and fugues, in each of the different keys. So, as we see, the fugue was often paired with the prelude, but not always. The fugue might have formed part of a larger work, even part of a choral work, or a larger work in general. One of the movements of a work might have been a fugue. Fugue was essentially a comp compositional procedure. That is what we have to remember. And, of course, the great masters were Bach and Handel, but almost all of the Baroque composers took advantage of the fugal method of composition, one doesn't want to call it a genre. But we're going to examine a famous example from Bach, his organ fugue in G minor, known colloquially as his little prelude, and as his little fugue rather, because he writes another similar work. So this is known affectionately as Bach's little organ fugue in G minor, and we're going to look at this work. It is a good example of fugue, and it presents most of the procedures that we have outlined. Uh, as opposed to some of the more idiosyncratic fugues, which are maybe not the best example, examples to use as an introduction. This is a, a classic example, and we're going to look at Bach's little organ fugue in G minor. Bach's organ fugue in G minor is one of his best known organ pieces. It is also known as the little fugue, to distinguish it from another longer fugue in G minor. This fugue is in 4-4 time and has four voices. As with any fugue, each voice presents the subject in turn in the opening exposition. In this fugue, the fugal subject is first announced in the soprano voice. It is then stated by the alto, tenor and bass voices. The bass line is intoned by the organ's pedals. The subject begins with the longer note value, namely a crotchet. This is followed by progressively shorter note values, namely quavers and then semiquavers. This particular fugue has a counter subject. It first appears in the soprano together with the answer form of the subject in the alto. Not all fugues have counter subjects. For a counter subject to be considered as such, it must be consistently stated throughout the fugue and serve as a regular companion to the subject. After the opening exposition, the subject appears five more times. Each time it is interspersed with an episode. Bach ensures harmonic contrast in this fugue by stating the subject twice in the relative major. The final statement of the subject is in the pedal line. The work ends with what is known as a tierce de Picardy. This means that the final chord is the tonic major chord borrowed from the major mode. Here you can hear the first statement of the fugal subject in the opening exposition in the soprano in the minor mode. Here you can hear the answer form of the subject in the alto. The counter subject appears in semiquavers in the soprano.
here you can hear the subject in the tenor with the counter subject above. Here you can hear the answer form of the subject in the bass played on the organ's pedals. You can also hear the counter subject in the tenor. Here you can hear the beginning of a brief episode which contains a pattern and sequence which moves in a downward fashion. Here you can hear the beginning of exposition 2. The subject begins in the tenor is continued by the soprano and is accompanied by a sustained note in the bass. Here you can hear a brief episode consisting of semiquavers moving in a downward sequence. Here you can hear the beginning of exposition 3. The subject is stated in the alto in the relative major key of B flat major with the counter subject in the soprano. Here you can hear the beginning of an episode in the relative major with upward leaps and a semiquaver passage. Here you can hear the subject stated in the bass by the organ's pedals in the relative major with the counter subject and a long chill above. Here you can hear the beginning of a longer episode which contains a descending pattern and sequence. The episode begins in the major mode and ends in the minor mode. Here you can hear the beginning of exposition 4. The subject is stated in the soprano in the subdominant key of C minor with the counter subject below it. Here you can hear the most extended episode in the work. It contains semiquavers which outline a descending pattern and sequence of broken or arpeggiated chords. This is followed by an upward pattern and sequence which leads to sustained high notes. Here you can hear the subject stated in the bass by the organ's pedals in the tonic minor with the counter subject in the soprano. The fugue ends with the tierce de Picardi, which is a tonic major chord borrowed from the major mode.